Sundays, we've looked at the topic, Training for Reigning. We've looked at some very interesting concepts, and I want to continue along that line this morning. This will be the third message in this series of messages along that line. In particular, this morning, I want to talk about a son of God, the bride of Christ. A son of God, the bride of Christ. How many of you know we are both? We're called sons of God, and we're also called the bride of Christ. And that seems like contradiction, how can a son of God also be the bride of Christ? We're going to talk about that. Are you all ready? Can you just turn that hand loose for one second and give God a hand clap? He is so marvelous. He is so worthy. He is so wonderful. He's so good, and he's done so much. Hallelujah. And now go ahead and take that neighbor's hand once again, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you. We do clap our hands in celebration and in adoration. We adore you, and so we celebrate you. We're thankful for being children of the Most High God, for having received your gift of eternal life, for having our names written in the Lamb's book of life. Thank you for preparing a place for us. Mansions await us. And so we're grateful. We ask, Lord, that your blessing will rest upon the word of God this morning. We're asking you, Father, to feed us with manna from heaven. And we give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. In Jesus' matchless name, let us shout amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Now be turning with me in your Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter 21. We've seen this text before, last Sunday and so. But again, today I'm talking specifically from this topic, a son of God, the bride of Christ. Sons of God and the bride of Christ does not speak of two separate things. A son of God and the bride of Christ does not speak of two separate things, rather the same thing in two different ways. How many of you know you can speak of the same thing in two different ways? How many of you of you know two nickels is not one dime, but they equal the same thing? And they give you the same value but they are not the same, but yet they are the same. They both equal 10 cents. Amen. So in the same way, the sons of God and the bride of Christ does not speak of uh, uh, of the same thing in terms of essence, but they speak of the same thing in terms of what's represented. God uses human concepts to communicate spiritual realities. 
And he does that to help us understand. He uses analogies, he uses parables, he uses concepts that we can relate to. So when he speaks of us as sons, he's communicating a concept we can relate to. When he speaks of us as brides, or the bride, he is using human terms to help us understand a spiritual reality. Sons of God and the bride of Christ does not speak of gender, male or female. Rather, they speak of position and rank as heavenly royalty. Sons of God and the bride of Christ are the highest positions in heaven, and they too speak of heavenly royalty. But they speak of it in different ways, using different terms. In Bible understanding, a son is one with his father. Just as a bride is one with her husband. So sons and brides both speak of one. Being one with the Father and one with the Son. Do you understand that? Both concepts speak of being one with God. As we saw last week, to be one with God has tremendous implications. Staggering, in fact. Both sonship and brideship are separate terms. Speaking of our position of ruling and reigning with God on his throne. So even though they're two different terms, they are speaking of the same position of power and of rulership in heaven. Sharing the throne of God and Christ, ruling and reigning with him in royalty. These concepts are communicated as sons of God and bride of Christ. Are you still with me? All that being said, so let's begin. Revelation chapter 21, and let's start at verse, verse 5. We've seen this before. Let me go over it again. Verse 5, And he that sat upon the throne, this speaks of God the Father, he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, John, write, for these things are true and faithful. John, I want you to write, because what I'm telling you, they're true, and these things are faithful. You can rely upon them. This is God the Father talking from his throne. And John was in heaven taking Dictatorial notes, if you will. Now, notice what the Father said, verse 7. He that overcometh, all those who walk in overcoming victorious uh, life here in the earth, who use their faith to put the devil under their feet and not be conquered by the devil, but put the devil in his place and conquer the devil. To overcome means to be a conqueror and to be a victorious one. Notice it says, he that overcomes shall inherit what? Now we know to inherit anything speaks of birthright. You only have an, inher an inheritance as you're born in a certain family line. You inherit what belongs to the family. Notice the father said, he who overcomes shall inherit how many things? Well, now that also includes the throne, because all things, meaning nothing is left out, doesn't it? Shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my what? Now, what does that mean? If he's my God and I am his son, that makes me a son of God. If he is my God, and I am his son, 
that makes me a son of God. As a son of God, I inherit all that the Father has. And the Father owns everything. So I inherit, therefore, as a son of God, all things. So we see this verse speaks of sonship. It speaks of being a son of God. And by virtue of that position, I inherit everything. Say amen. amen. Now let's notice chapter 3, please, in verse 21. Hallelujah. As sons of God, we reign with God. Because in, the, uh, in your Bible, the concept of a son, a son works with his father, not for his father. Servants work for the father. Sons work with the father. Sons share the throne of the father. Amen. Now notice chapter 3 and look at verse 21. To him, now this is the son talking. This writing is red, isn't it? Now this is the son of God speaking. Jesus. To him that overcometh. Same thing the father said. To him that lives an overcoming victorious life here in the earth, putting the devil under their feet. Him will I grant to do what? Notice sit with. Notice the word with. I will grant him to sit with me. Glory. Sit with me where? Now notice that is sit with me as, as my bride. See, we're the father's sons, but we're the son's bride. And uh, see, listen, let me just explain this. We know God made Adam and Eve. The Bible says he made both of them in his image. Both of them had the same nature, essence, and God likeness, Adam and Eve, man and female. In fact, your Bible says he called them, Adam and Eve, he called them Adam. So the woman had the name of Adam just like Adam did. And listen, and your Bible says he blessed them. Not he blessed him. He blessed them and told them to subdue and have dominion. In other words, the man and his bride shared the same authority, rank, and position. Both of them were to have dominion equally. Because, see, the woman came out of Adam's side, which meant she was equal to him. And so they both were named Adam by God the Father. And they both had the position of dominance in the earth. Equally, because, you see, the woman shares the rank of her husband. So, Jesus says, if you overcome, I'll let you sit with me on my throne. What does that mean? You'll have equal rank with me. Glory to God. I conquer, you conquer. I subdue, you subdue. I dominate, you dominate. I reign, you reign. Hallelujah. We both carry the same name. Hallelujah. Now notice what Jesus says. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. So we know Jesus sits on the right hand of the father. Amen. In heaven, ruling and reigning over the entire uh, universe. And now we see Jesus says, if you, if you overcome, I'll let you sit with me. You can sit with me as, as my bride as we share the Father's throne. The Father says, you share my throne as a son. You become one with my son. Do you understand? So you see here how the Bible is using the, the term son and the term bride equally. They both, they both speak of sitting upon the throne of the Father, sharing his glory, his power, his might. But they say it in two different terms. Now, let's just keep reading. Notice chapter 7 and look at verse 9. Hallelujah. Oh, the 
the future of the church. It is beyond, you know, the Bible says God has prepared such things. The mind has not conceived, the eye has not seen. What is awaiting us is so spectacularly glorious. I'll tell you, you shouldn't want to miss it for the world. You shouldn't let anything pull you away. You shouldn't let anything dominate your life. No, because only overcomers get this promise, you see. Now notice chapter 7. This is going to be so interesting. Look at verse 9. This is the church in heaven. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could count. This is all the redeemed in heaven. Of all nations, all kindreds, all peoples, and all tongues. Notice they stood before the throne. And before who? Now, now notice this is the redeemed of all creation, all mankind who were born again. They're standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And that verse says, and they're dressed in white. Now, you know what this is? This is the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we're all standing before the Father. Lo! And the Son is at his right hand. And the Father is about to commence the ceremony to marry us to the Son. We're all standing before uh, the Father. We're all dressed in white. And the Son is, of course, by the right hand of the Father. Hallelujah. Look at the next verse. Uh, this is going to be important later. And they cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God. What does that mean? We have made it to heaven. We've overcome the world. This is ultimate salvation. Now look at verse 11 and don't miss it. And all the angels stood where? How many angels? Notice they are not standing before the throne with the church. They're around about it. They are witnessing the marriage. Have you ever noticed when people get, get married, they come, they stand here, and then all the party is around. But they stand in front and before to accept the nuptials, the, you know, this is what this speaks of. The church is before the throne. All the redeemed, your Bible says. Then it says, all the angels. That means there's not one left out. All the angels are around, not before the throne, like in a marriage, but they are like around, watching this spectacular. All the angels, they're witness the church be enthroned with the Father and the Son. They marvel at us because they know our destiny. But now notice, look if you will please at verse 4, the latter part, uh, 14. And they have washed their robes and made them white. And the blood of the Lamb. This speaks of the bride of Christ, the church. Because they are in white, therefore are they before the throne, ready to commence the wedding ceremony. Now here is what I want you to see. You don't get before the throne in this company of people with all the angels around watching, except you have on white. This is important. Notice, therefore are they before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night, where? That means they never leave. See, you are part of the throne now. And you don't serve for, you are serving now with. You're serving now with, you see. You never leave the temple day and night. See, in other words, you are seated now with Christ. See, Christ never leaves that position. He's the eternal enthroned Son of God. When the church is, is uh, uh, how do I say it? It's made his bride with him. We also receive this eternal position. Notice a day and night, and he that sit 
sitteth upon the throne shall, uh, uh, shall what? Read it. Now, if you have any other translation, you can do your own study of this. This phrase, dwell among them, actually means cover them with his tent. Any other translation translates it that way. What does it mean to be t covered in God's tent? It means you're in the family. That's a Hebrew idiom, which means, say, I cover you. You are now my bride. That's what the concept is. And notice what it says, please. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst. Why? Because as the Lamb's bride, he is fully committed to taking care of us, nourishing us, and what? Cherishing us. See, as his bride, you are completely nourished and cherished by him. You are, now look at, look at verse 17. For the Lamb, not the Father, but the Son. See, we're his bride. For the Lamb, praise God. Notice, who is in the midst of the throne shall feed them. Well, what does that mean? That means he takes full responsibility as the husband to cherish you and to nourish you. He nourishes his bride. He cherishes his bride. It was Adam's job to go in the field and provide for Eve. But both Adam and Eve had the same authority. Do you understand these concepts? But both Adam and Eve had the same rank of authority. But it was the man's job to cherish his wife and to uh, nurture or provide for her. Now, for, let me show you this concept. And it says, hang on to this passage, but go, if you will, to uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and look at verse 21. Hallelujah. How oh, glory. We'll have no concerns. He will cover us under his tent. Once he does that, he say, I'm going to feed you. I'm going to take care of your thirst. I'm going to meet every need you have. You just go and enjoy your authority. Glory to God, you Notice chapter 5, look at verse 29. Ephesians. No man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourish, that word nourish means to feed. But he feeds and he cherishes it or he cares for it delicately. Even as Christ and what? Even as the Lord and the church. See, that speaks of the marriage of the bride to Christ. He feeds her because he cherishes her. That's his responsibility. In heaven, we will be enthroned as the bride of Christ. We will share his throne. But your Bible says once the ceremony has commenced and we have been enthroned as his bride, he will take full responsibility to feed us. Not the father, the lamb. Amen. Look at the next verse, please. Right there. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his blood. Of, or of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his mother and father. This is in Genesis when God married Adam and Eve. For this cause shall a man leave his mother and father. And shall be joined unto his wife. And they too shall be what? See marriage. The concept is we're one. We're one with Christ. We're one on his throne. Look at verse 20. Uh, verse 32. This is, a, have I read verse 31? Yeah, verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the what? What's a great mystery? That we are married to him. We're a bone of his bone. We're flesh of his flesh. He's using natural analogies to communicate a spiritual truth. What is that? The church is one with him. Which means, listen, we share the throne. But yet, he cherishes us. Do you all see this? Now, go back, if you will, please. Look at Revelation 19. Remember, we just read from Revelation 7. There's much people in heaven, and they shout, hallelujah, salvation, right? 
in Revelation 19, it, it's an account of the same event, the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's the exact same event, but Revelation 19 gives a bit more detail. Notice Revelation 19, please, and look at verse Look at verse 1. And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven. That's every kindred, every tribe, every tongue. That's the same group. Saying, hallelujah, and what else? That's the same thing they said in chapter 7. Thank God we made it from earth to heaven. Thank God for salvation. Now notice, but then the 19 gives a bit more detail. It, it, it shows a clearer picture. Look at verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his bride has made herself ready. It's talking about the marriage. What does that mean? We are one with him on his throne. To all those who overcome, I'll grant you to sit with me as my bride. To sit with him means to be one with him. Notice with him, with him, with. As a husband and wife are together. Hallelujah. Verse 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and what? See, there's the white linen again. Every person that will be in this event will have on white. Why? Because it's a marriage. And listen, and the bride stands before the father and the son, and the father commences the ceremony, and the bride steps up with the son. <laughs> Woo! And, and all the angels will be witnesses, all of them. There will not be one angel on duty on that day. They will all be summoned to the wedding ceremony of the father's son. This is so tremendous. That's us. And when we get to heaven, and when it commences, all we're going to say is, glory! <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> glory to God. And look at verse uh, uh, 9. And he said unto me, write! Write what? Blessed are they who are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. See, that's the Son of God. That's his marriage. And then there's this, what we call it after the uh, wedding, we have the reception. It's going to be a big feast. And you know what? And all the angels just going to be marveling. Like, wow, they're on the throne with the Father and the Son, with all authority. Blessed are they who are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he that said unto me, these are the true sayings of God. He says, what I'm showing to you, this is true. It's going to be just like I'm telling you. Don't doubt it. Embrace it. We are destined. For a place in the universe, our peanut minds can't begin to grasp. But we believe it. And when you believe it, you wait patiently. Hallelujah! You all know what the Bible says. Go to Revelation chapter 3. Jesus gave this parable. He said that there was a king who was providing a marriage for his son. And Jesus says, and there were people who were called who didn't show up. And uh, your Bible says, and uh, they were not worthy. And the Father said, throw them into outer darkness. There shall be gnashing and weeping of, you know, gnashing of teeth and weeping. Why? He said, for many are called, but few are chosen, you see. In other words, if God has given you the opportunity to make it to this wedding supper, don't miss it. 
don't miss it, Jesus said. All right. Now notice chapter 3 and look at verse 1. Notice the last two words of verse 1. They are what? Read. Are dead. Yes, two. Yes, two. <laughs> are dead. Now, this is Jesus talking to a church, and he tells his church that you are dead. Now, that's something, please, Lord, don't ever look down at Victoria's Living Fellowship and say, you all are dead. Because if you're dead, you ain't going to heaven. Jesus says God is not the God of the dead, but he's the God of the living. Amen. He don't own dead stuff. So here's a church that's dead, Jesus said. Well, but now look, if you will, please, at, at verse 4. Jesus says, thou hast a few names, a few members, even in Sardis, that has not defiled their garments. And they shall walk how? In white, for they are worthy. Now, this is the bride. Notice, listen, they shall walk where? With me, with me, right alongside of me. As the church is taken from Adam's side, that's Adam and Eve. Notice they shall walk with me in what color? And he said, because they're worthy. They're worthy. They shall walk with me. Hallelujah. Verse 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in what? That's the bride. You don't become the bride in heaven except you overcome here upon earth. This concept is so important to get. You don't let the devil defeat you in earth and then expect to rule and reign in heaven. The earth is training ground. It's proving ground. It's proving your worthiness to be his bride. Hallelujah! He says to only those who haven't damaged their garments will be with me in heaven because they're worthy. What does that mean? To be worthy means they're overcomers. What does the word overcome mean? It means to conquer, walk in victory. Hallelujah. Jesus ain't going to marry no weak, defeated, decrepit woman. I said the father ain't going to let him do it. I said, see, in Bible days, it's the father who selected the bride. And the father going to give his son something worthy of him. Something that can rule and reign alongside of him. Well, you see, we prove our worthiness here in the earth, you understand. Now, this church, he said, hey, you guys are dead, meaning, you know, you're given over to the devil. You just quit, gave up. He said, but there's still a few of you there who still can wear white. Because you haven't given in to the devil. You're still, just a few of you living victorious. And this few will walk with me. In white. Listen, walking with him means alongside of him as his bride. The white represents the winning, the bride of Christ. We just read that. But you have to be worthy to win. What makes a believer worthy? Overcoming. Overcoming. Never quitting. Never giving up. Never giving in. Never taking down. Never taking back. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. All right. Notice chapter 2 and look at verse 18. Chapter 2 and look at verse 18, please. This is going to be very, very important. Notice what it says there, verse 18. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write. Write what? These things say unto the Son of God. Now, who's talking here? Yeah, the Son of God. He said, these things say unto the Son of God. So now notice Jesus identifies himself as the Son of God here, right? Right. Look at verse 26. And he that overcometh. Jesus, why you got to keep telling me that? Because you can't have heaven except you do. Because you can't have heaven except you do. You don't go to heaven letting the devil defeat you. I said you don't go to heaven living a decrepit, pathetic, weak, pitiful life. And then think somebody going to give your weak self a throne. 
throne is for winners. Hallelujah. Notice what it says. The Son of God. He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end. Unto the end. To him will I give what? Power over. Now, you don't get power over. See, to have power over means rulership. Only people who overcome will I give power over. Now, notice Jesus says, I will give you power over. To another church, he said, if you overcome, you will walk with me. Well, walking with him means you rule and reign with him, you see. Here he said, if you overcome, I'll give. The Son of God is talking. He said, I'll give you power over. To have power over anything means rulership, doesn't it? Means that you rule over. I'll give you power over what? Read it. Say it loud. Power over what? That's the whole world. Nation to plural. That's the whole world. Now notice I give you power over the whole world. You'll rule and reign with me from, from my throne in heaven. Notice, if you will, just stay looking. Notice now what he says in verse 27. And he, when I give you power over, and he shall rule them. Notice he didn't say I will. He said who will? He who overcomes. I'll give you power. I'll share my authority, my rank, my position with you. And you shall rule over all the world. With a what? That means with total, absolute authority. I'll give you absolute authority. I'll give you power to rule and reign absolutely. Woo! Well, I can't wait. You say, oh, Victor, you ain't nothing. You ain't seen me yet. The Bible says we are now called the sons of God, but it does not yet appear what we shall be. But when we see him, we shall be like, like as and he, like, like, like he is, you understand? Hallelujah. Oh, now notice. I'll give you power and you shall rule and reign. Oh, my God, with an hour, that means with absolute authority. Look at the last part of that. Even as I received of my what? Now, who's talking? The Son of God, who's sitting by the right hand of the Father, on the Father's throne. He said, you overcome, you will come up here with us on the throne. As my Father gave me power over all the nations, I will also share it with you, and you shall rule and reign with me. They'll submit to you just like you were me. Because you also will be the Father's son, and you also will be my bride. In biblical understanding, the wife carries the same authority as the husband. Eve had the same rank as Adam. Are you all understanding? Okay, I hope you're getting this. Y'all say, I know Rod, yeah, because Rod is, whoo, Rod is all that. <laughs> Notice chapter 12, look at verse, verse, uh, verse 5. Chapter 12, and look at verse 5. He said, I give it to you even as my father has given this to me. Notice chapter 12, and look at verse 5. And she brought forth a man child. She gave birth. This is Jesus' birth. Who was to rule all the nations with absolute authority. And her child was caught up unto God and to his what? So if we're going to rule the nations like the father gave it to Christ the son with all authority, we got to do it from the position of the throne. Do you see this? You do it from the position of what? See, we're in training here for reigning. Reigning on the throne. Hallelujah. He said, as the Father gave me this position to rule the nations, he said, so do I give it to you. I rule with absolute authority, and they will respect me as a one with absolute authority. He says, but you don't get this position except you overcome. Hallelujah. Well, let me just keep reading. Notice chapter 11 and look at verse 15. Verse 15. 
Notice he says. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world is to become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign for how long? And we're going to reign with him. But look at verse 18. And the nations were angry. Who cares? And the nations were angry. Who cares? I have absolute authority now. I rule with him from the throne of heaven. Who cares? Well, you see, you got to get used to overcoming here and not being offended if you hurt somebody's feelings here. You got to stand for the truth here. You got to have a backbone of steel here. You got to develop as a conqueror here. So when you reign up there, if somebody mad, who cares? I have absolute authority over you. You develop that here. Are y'all seeing this? And the nations were mad. Why? Because we have total authority. Well, now notice chapter 20 and look at verse 5, uh, uh, verse 4. Chapter 20 and look at verse 4. And I saw thrones, plural, plural. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment, that's ruling authority, was given unto them. Now, this is the redeemed. The Bible says these are the ones in whom the second death had no power. The second death speaks of being thrown into hell, doesn't it? See, that means we are not hell bound, we're heaven bound, you see. And I saw thrones. You're going to have one, I'm going to have one. We're going to be all joined to the throne of God. And I saw thrones and them that sat upon them. And judgment, or that is ruling authority, was given unto them. Look at the latter part of it, verse 4. And they shall live and reign with Christ, not apart from Christ, but they're joint heirs with Christ. They're sons of God with Christ. They're the bride of Christ. And they shall reign with Christ for how long? Now, that's this thousand-year utopian reign upon this planet when all the nations will have to submit. Notice your Bible says we're going to rule and reign with them. Now, the first thing to notice is that we're going to, first of all, it says we're going to live a thousand years. Well, you see, death will have no more power over us. And then we're going to rule and reign with the Lord. And your Bible says we're going to do it because we will all have a throne. If you can just let your mind accept these concepts, it would be hard to have a down day. Because I know where I'm headed. I know my future is just magnificently glorious. Hallelujah. Oh, let me hurry up. Amen. Now look at chapter 2 and look at verse 28. I think it's going to be so marvelous. I'm going to be standing up there. The Bible says it's going to be a number no man can count from every kindred, every tribe, tribe, every nation, every tongue. And then I'm going to look around and see all the angels standing around with Google eyes looking at this wonderful ceremony. As God presents to his son, his bride. And all the angels just round about just looking. And then that verse says, and then they all fall down and worship. They're worshiping all of us. The father, the son, and the son's bride. I know, see, that's hard to get because we think of ourselves too poorly. But I said, go to chapter 2 and what? Okay, chapter 2 and look at verse 28. All right. Notice it says, now, and I didn't finish this, so I'm going to pick it up here. Notice it says, and I will give them the morning star. Now, that makes no sense if you don't know what the morning star represents, does it? He says, if you overcome, he said, I give you power over all the nations. He, shall, he said, you shall rule them with a rod of iron. He said, even as the Father gave it to me, I give it to you. Then he says in verse 28, and. I will give them, over the overcomers, the morning star. 
Now, let me listen to me carefully. The morning star speaks of the brightest star in heaven. Listen. And when it appears, it always speaks of a new king being born. Listen to me carefully. Notice he says, I give you power to rule. I let you rule over all the nations. And then he says, and I will give you the morning star. The morning star always speaks of kingship. Remember when Jesus was born, the wise men saw the star. And they came and said, where is he born king of the Jews? The morning star means you have become a king. I'm going to show you. He says, I'm going to give you this. Woo! Glory to God. Give it to me, Lord. Notice if you will, chapter 22 and look at verse 16. Chapter 22 and look at verse 16. I'm going to show you that the morning star speaks of kingship. So when Jesus says, I give you the morning star, see, they're going to see the same star over you that they saw over Jesus. No, oh my God, a king has been born. Hallelujah. Notice chapter 22, look at the latter part of verse 16. Notice Jesus says, I am the root and offspring of who? David is kingship, isn't it? And the bright in the morning, what? So no, notice the morning star is tied into becoming a king. You see that the morning star speaks of kingship. It speaks of the new dawning of a new kingdom with a king. Well, when God said, I make all things new, he says, I grant you to rule and reign with me. This speaks of when we are enthroned with Christ, new kings are born. It's the beginning of a new kingdom. His kingdom will come now. Now, notice again, Jesus says, if you overcome, I give you the morning star. Then he defines what the morning star represents. It represents kingship. He said, I am of the lineage of David, which means I take on the kingdom of David because I'm the morning star. The morning star speaks of kingship. Do you see this? So Jesus says, church, if you overcome... You get the star. The kind of star that the wise men saw when they said, where is he born king? A king has been born. How do you know? The star. You get the star. Hallelujah. A king is being born. His name is Victor. <laughs> say, oh, you shouldn't say that. The Bible says it. We need to embrace it and get excited about it. Start feeling sorry for your little self. Look at where you're going. You're just training for raining. Uh, no, you know, ain't nothing ever good happen to me. I just, I just, I, and you give up and just walk all over you. Well, you just, uh, you, I ain't going to say it. <laughs> notice, no, notice Revelation 19. Let me just show you a couple of more things. Here. Revelation 19, and look at verse 15. I like y'all so much. You know why I really don't want to go to anybody else and preach? Because you can't share half the stuff. You guys choke on it, but you try to get it down. <laughs> you know, but, uh, but look, at, look at verse 15, please. Well, let me read verse 12 first. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. This is Jesus. Jesus wears a crown, many crowns. Verse 15. And out of, and out of his mouth, of course, a two-edged sword, that with it he should smite the nations and rule them with a rod of iron. Well, we're going to be doing it with him, right? Yeah, look at verse 16. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Notice king and kings, a king of kings and Lord of lords rule the nations with a rod of iron. That's why Jesus says, when you shall rule the nations, I'll give you the star. 
you become a king. You become like me. Are y'all here? So now if this be true, how can you go through life being down? If you believe this book. How can you go through life feeling sorry for yourself? I'm, like, I'm bad. Uh, you know what I say? I'm a king. They say that's just stupid when you know this. See, talking in that pitiful way only has weight in your heart if you don't believe any of this. If you believe this book, you can't be pitiful. You got to be an overcomer. You got to be a victorious one. You got to be a conqueror. I'm going to read this and then I'm going to quit. Notice, if you will, chapter 3 and look at verse 11. Chapter 3 and then verse 11. Hallelujah. Notice what Jesus says to another church. Notice he says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that which thou hast, that no man do what? Notice, see, you have a crown waiting. The whole book of Revelation reveals real royalty. You have a crown. Notice it says, don't let no man take it. What does that mean? Don't get so caught up in this world and what people think about you and how much money somebody are making that you're not making and just stupid stuff that you get so distracted. Let me tell you something. When Jesus gave this parable about the father, he said that there was a king representing the father. There was a king who was putting the, together a, a marriage for his son, Jesus said. And then he said, and many were bitten, but they gave excuses. One said, I got to go take care of my farm. The other says, I got, got, you know, I got to take care of my merchandise. And other words, I'm so busy trying to make money. Let me tell you something. If you make $25 billion and miss heaven, you're stupid. I can't say it no plainer. What's a little money here? Never be happy. Money don't make you happy. I've had money. I had no money. Sometimes I was more happy with no money than I had when I had money. Life is not about that. It's about who you are, who you understand yourself to be, and how you are before you. And then listen, 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 listen. And then what did you do? Get $25 billion in this little short period of time. Then you spend eternity lost. Those people who said, well, I, I'm too busy, you know, I'm making money, I can't come. And then uh, when, uh, when they showed up, the father put them all out because they did not have them white. See, the bride got to have them white. And then Jesus says, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The great regret they shall feel. He said, they shall be cast in the outer darkness. These are people who could have been a part of the wedding. But they, they let stuff distract them. This is sad. But we see it every day. Here's what I want you to see. Behold, I come quickly, hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Now look at the latter part of verse 9. Notice Jesus says, Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and that they might know that I love you because you are my bride. Now, notice, if you will, Jesus says he's going to make unsaved people. That verse talks about the devil, Satan. He's going to make unsaved people come at your feet and worship you. Why? Because you're going to have on a crown. See, when we share the throne with the Father and the Son, listen, we become the Son of the Father and the Bride of the Son. Those two terms mean the same thing. A position of royal dignity and rank in heaven on the throne. Listen, when you're in that position and you wear your crown like the father and the son, the Bible says the son has many crowns. You will have a crown. People will, because you have absolute authority. He said you will rule them with a rod of iron. That's absolute authority. He said they'll bow before you and worship. Now, Jesus said that, not a man. Who said it? Is that writing red? 
do you believe your master? Well, this is your future. This is your eternity. This is your destiny. This is where we're headed. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I believe every word. I believe the Bible. I believe the truth. God said, write these things for they are faithful and they are true. He said, write this, write that. I want my church to know these things right. Because listen, this is a love letter from heaven sent to earth to encourage us. You know, I'm writing another book and I mentioned this. There's a passage in the Bible that talks about letters coming from a far country. How they refresh you. I've never been in the military, but I can't imagine if I'm in a foxhole for weeks and months and I got this old sloppy guy next to me with dirty feet, eating the beans out of can, you know, cold, and I get a sweet love letter from home. How that would inspire me to keep going. How that would inspire me to live because I got to make it home. These, what we'll read, see, these are, this is a letter from heaven. As a love letter to his church. To inspire us. To motivate us. Hang in there. Keep going. Because one day. You're coming home. You're going to make it home. So when I pick up this book. I always get inspired. I don't know if you noticed. I, I pick up this book and it's just. Oh my God. It's like a letter from a far country. Precious my soul. Thank you for these precious truths. Now the problem is you got to believe them. You got to know that they're faithful and true. You got to know that these are the true sayings of God. It's senseless to say you accept Jesus then don't believe anything he says to you. What kind of religion do you have? Can I tell you? No, you don't want to hear the truth. <laughs> Come on, stand to your feet. Come on.